that's quite the wall of fame behind you. Oh, it's and it's it's one of let's see three. The second one is extends. Is it all yeah. baseball hats or is it actual like memorabilia and stuff too? Uh, as I'm looking out, it's mostly pictures, some posters, a couple of sticks, and then on by the bar, there's the gate autograph poster, the Marichek autograph poster, and then the 2006 Canadian National. Wow. Yeah, it's you probably cool. win for best archive. You are a brew baker, I think. Yeah, well, Ken's got a few more years on me, but, you know, yeah, I, I got some good stuff. Nice. How you holding up? How you doing? Uh, today was a today was a tough day. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Uh, it's my birthday, Happy and I birthday. just day. Thank you. And I just you know it was just one of those days where you just feel a little melancholy, and uh, it was just tough. But uh, birthday dinner was good, and just spending some time with Gail and Rachel that kind of helped. So I'm feeling. I'm feeling better on the up, up How are you in, in this is recording. We can include this or we can wait till the boys hop on or whatever, but um, how are you teaching right now? Are, are, are you giving assignments? Are you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <coughs> when, when did it start? Uh, March 13th was our last day. And uh, we had meetings probably the previous two weeks to talk about, uh, what the what the teachers were going to do if there was indeed a school shutdown? Yeah, we were kind of gearing up to work on some online assignments anyway. So we've been doing that since since we stopped. So probably March what sixteenth that Monday. That's when we started doing the uh, uh, online classes, and we just got back from spring break. So yeah. day was the first the first real day back since. Um, since then so we've been we've been going and we've been given the uh, edict that we are going to continue teaching online until the school year is completed nice and I think the seniors are going to have maybe one less week than initially planned okay we're, yeah we're going all right well Losi chimed in I, I don't know if as have you two ever met shook hands yeah. okay yep yeah. I, I figured as much with as much media and as many events as Costello covers yeah. um, that you guys would have crossed paths, but I've never been there to shake hands and say, introduce you guys. So um, we, while didn't we're, we didn't need you. We're good. Okay. Thanks. Uh, while we're waiting for Colin, uh, yeah. we're going to officially kick this thing off. Mike and I were making some small talk ahead of time. Um, and, and I'll make the intro in a second. But John Losey, it is Mike's birthday today. Oh, our first birthday on the podcast. How about, how about that? that? Yeah, so as, as I was trying to book guests this week. Thanks. Yeah, as I was trying to book guests this week, he said, how about the 14th? That's my birthday. I said, let's do it. So yeah. 28 again, birthday man. dinner. 28, I got to tell you, 28 again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I had to stop at some point. My father-in-law said, you know, you ought to just do it every other year. And I'm thinking that's probably a good, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Go by twos. Yeah. If it wasn't for my kids, I don't know if I'd celebrate my birthday. They're the ones that make the big deal out of it. I would. I, I do have a big one coming up, though. June 27th, 50. 50. I don't feel 50, I got to tell you. Yeah. Not it's at all. It's not so bad. No, I'm not worried about it. It's just yeah. a number. I mean, yeah. 50, 50 is really the new 38 now. So. Oh, good. Easy. Yeah. yeah. So, Costello, what was the birthday dinner? Uh... Well, I had, I had told Gail uh, a couple weeks ago, I said, Man, I'm, I'm just dying for some pizza. So I'm a simple guy. She, I said, how about Jets? She said, okay. So she went out to get Jets, but they were, they were closed for whatever reason. So oh. she went the next the level up. She went buddies. Ooh. And I used to go, when I was living in Oak Park in high school, we used to go to the buddies in Hamtramck, Six and Conan. Yeah, all the time. So it was walk down memory lane. Nice. So, can't go wrong. Can't go wrong. Well, yeah, I will tell you though, I, I did a buddy's, you know, I've been doing the DoorDash thing and my DoorDash bill. I mean, this this whole, you know, lock-in thing's gotta end because my DoorDash and Grubhub bills are just like 
it's yeah. crazy. But you know, I, I did I did buddies, and and it, it wasn't there was something wrong with it. There was something amiss. I don't know what was wrong with it. it wasn't yeah. uh, it wasn't the typical buddies. It was really weird. So I'm gonna go pick it up next time. I'm not doing Grubhub buddies. Can't do it. Yeah. I think it's bad. It's better in the restaurant when you get it right out of the oven. Yeah. No question. Yeah. yeah I've become a Grubhub and uh, DoorDash connoisseur. Uh, you know, streaming, streaming shows, lacrosse, and pretty much DoorDash Grubhub is really my sweet spot. Cool. I, I, I'll, I'll do the flip side of that. We have not done a single carryout since this started. Good for you. Wow. We, we have, um, we're one of those families that we just don't do a lot of carryouts. We don't go out a lot. Um, we're never all together as a group <laughs> because of lacrosse season. Yeah. Uh, so we went out, I went out and stocked up on groceries and we've been consistent. It's our compost pile has never been richer, which is good, I guess. But all right, let's, um, let's talk lacrosse. Let's talk Mike. Right. Let's talk all this stuff. So, so I'm going to assume Mike that you have watched a couple of these. I, I have, I have not watched them all, but pretty close. We were grinding quite a few out at one point. Um, there's no so, format. So like I want to introduce no you. Tomorrow. It was like we were doing like one on top of the other, like it was a world tour, and this was the last world tour ever. Yeah. We, we were grinding them out like five in a week at one point. Um, but, but we only have 13 episodes. Um, I want to introduce you as, as not only as a journalist, as a coach, as a player, as a dad of a player – but one of my best friends in the game, one of those guys that I just, I don't even remember where we first met, but as soon as we connected and became Facebook friends, there were, there were a dozen late night conversations of us just banging away, trying to save the world's problems. I think maybe uh, 2011, we had a game we played, we had the Green Hills team that uh, went out and played at Rice and we played the maybe the freshman team at that point, and you, you officiated the game. I know. I remember that. Yeah. Was it now? Do we do what we year? do anything before? I think it was 2011, Okay. I think. We definitely knew of sure. each other yeah. if we were not friends, like, friendly yet. It um, could have been M Live. Could have been. Yeah. We yeah. could have been, like, uh, pals that we didn't know on, online. With well, all did you ever go on the M Live boards? Oh yeah, because I know Costello and I were there. But but Losi, were, were you familiar with the M Live boards back then? You know, uh, just more uh, just joke manners. I would hear people talk about the you know the Michigan fans and all that stuff, especially with Rich Rod, right? Rich Rod, and then they they made that parody on YouTube or on uh, I don't know what it was, where they're doing those characters and you could put in your own voice and uh, you know Rich Rod is an offensive genius. I remember that 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 just makes me laugh like crazy. So M Live had a forum, a message yeah. board type format for each of the most popular high school sports. And some of them were absolute cesspools. And some yeah. of them were the only place to go and have a conversation. Because if you wanted to talk, you know, football and high school recruiting, there was dozens of Spartan mags and MGO blogs and all kinds of stuff where you could go and have banter about football and recruiting and what was there. But with lacrosse, some of us stumbled on there and actually used it to have conversations kind of like these on, you know, rules or the MHSAA or, or you know, rankings or, you know, best players of all time. And, and, and some of us, um, you know, you'd always get kind of stuff. I remember the one year Celine was really good. There was a lot of Celine people on there talking smack. And there was, you know, there were some people that would pop up just to, with a fake account to trash somebody by name or mm -hmm. accuse, you know, I'll never forget the person that was on there trying to say that Brother Rice was buying houses for recruits <laughs> in Bloomfield Hills so that they would then go and roll up Brother Rice. And I'm like, just give them the 11 grand in tuition and maybe save the quarter million dollars in the house. I don't know, crazy mm -hmm. me. Um, but I was one of the more vocal people on there because at the time I was just a youth coach. I, I wasn't associated with any high school. I was just a Rice alum and a proud Rice fan. And so I kind of became the de facto old man, you know, guy on the forum. Um, and I think Costello, did you post as Mike Costello or did you post under a different name? Uh, I, I might have had a. I probably had a nickname or something, but I was coaching 
And my kids in 2002, 2003 said, oh, you got to go to, to the message boards on MLive. And I did. And there were, there were teams that we were playing. That was like the scouting report we could get. Yeah. We got some information from, on players that, on teams that we played. And it was kind of like the only way that we could get information. Because back then, it was a wild, wild west. There was no sharing of tape. There was nothing like that. Yeah. You know, guys oh, is there, is there, is there sharing of tape now? <laughs> <laughs> well, they, I guess they do sometimes. But, yeah, I mean, we had a team, and I, I won't say the school, but they, we played them once, and then we played them in the playoffs, and they switched jerseys. So we had no idea of who was who. The numbers were different. It was like, wow, really? Really? Yeah. All because somebody was on the MLI board saying, watch out for 17. He's got a good left hand. And Yeah. We do a scout, get some numbers, and then they would change them. It's like, whoa, wait, this isn't that kid. The, uh, the one thing I remember most is that there was a, a jokingly a bounty out for somebody with the username Rev Ketchup who would just <laughs> go in there and, and blow up comments and people. Yeah. Um, somebody – posted fraudulently a couple times as some of the bigger coaches in the game, like created accounts on, with their names on it, trying to get, you know, controversial people in trouble. Yeah. Um, but there was some good conversations on there pre Twitter about best players of an era or best player mm -hmm. you ever saw or, or, or scouting reports or the 300 mile rule or the MHSAA or all American selection process or coaches association. Um, and, and what I found out over the years was every coach read it. They might not have posted there, and they mm -hmm. might have had a team rule. Like, I remember Kaminsky saying, nobody on Clarkson is allowed to post here. Right. Knock it off. Like, we, we do not get in the weeds. Um, but I remember after the state championship one year, you know, all the refs and, and coaches that didn't make it to that game, we go watch the state final, and then we go end up having a pint somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, we were at the gathering place right over by Troy High, or Troy mm -hmm. Athens, and, and the, the legend, Ron Hebert, says to me, you know, that board's uh, really sucked and it's been nothing since Drew and stopped posting on there. I'm like, <laughs> oh, I've been exposed. They know who I am. I'm, yeah. sure it was hard to, I'm sure it was hard to figure out, too. I'm sure you didn't make it obvious. I, I was very pro-Rice. Mm -hmm. Very pro-Rice. Yeah. Um, and at the time, Rice was, you know, rolling. So, uh, Chris Colin, welcome. Good evening. How are you, sir? Sorry, a few minutes late. That's all right. We still love you. Uh, we I did not do M Live. Coach Holtz or was a huge M Live guy, probably one of the biggest ones around. So I would just ask Coach Holtz what was on M Live. That's all, or whatever the heck, whatever that thing was that board. So yeah. you, so you, uh, you can collaborate all of this M Live stuff. I refused to go on it, but uh, Coach Holtz was a big, big uh, proponent of it. So I would just ask him. Nice. Yeah, I remember there was some, like, scandalous moment where somebody named me by name for one of the – one of the people stirring a lot, a lot of the trouble said, oh, we all know it's Chris Druin. And that's when I finally kind of came out from behind my username and said, actually, no, I'm Chris Druin. And if you're going to say that I don't do anything for the game, I coach here, I coach here, I coach mm -hmm. here. I've been involved in U.S. lacrosse, I've, and I kind of gave my, like, don't say I don't give back to the game, and I'm one of these keyboard warriors, like, I, I am involved. Um, but enough about the, the MLive days, unless you were Rev Ketchup, and then I want to know. No, no, no one, one last thing. You know, we used to, I used to read that stuff, and we would play, when Canton played a big game, I think we played Grand Haven or one of those, those teams in the early years, and they would have informal polls. And they said, oh, I think Grand Haven's going to beat Canton easily, easily. And I, I used that as billboard material for the kids. I said, yeah. hey, nobody thinks we're going to win. So let's see what we can do. So we used it for our advantage. Well, and the biggest reason why most of us got on there in the first place is pre-Twitter, it was the place that you could find scores. So if you knew there was a huge, that, yeah. you know, Troy Triathens, uh, you know, Clarkston versus a, a Lake Orion Rice CC, there were parents that would be posting on there from their old flip phones during the game, and you would get halftime updates and end of the quarter or, or stuff like that. So most of us got there originally just trying to find scores, just trying to find, you know, who won, and then it ballooned up from there. And now Twitter's taken over and MLive has killed all those forums. But, yeah, a lot of us, I think, back 
like you said, 2002, 2003, we're, we're, you know, trying to, to be adults and have conversations on there. I don't think I ever really trash anyone by name on there. Um, but, but I remember, you know, th there was a couple of people that were frequent, you know, topics, a couple schools that were frequent topics. So. I've been trashed multiple times. <laughs> well, yeah, but <laughs> that, this we know. I mean, that's a given. I mean, we, yeah. we already assumed that before you even got in here, Chris. I mean, <laughs> so a couple big bombshell items that I want to run by the three of you. Um, today is April 14th, in addition to my Costello. Happy birthday. Um, okay. Johns Perfect. Hopkins and Dave Petromala have agreed mm -hmm. to part ways. Uh, and it was a very interesting press release that said that he would um, voluntarily and responsibly not be coming back next year. Um, bombshell. I mean, I, I, Mike, I know you're a Syracuse guy, but you've got to have a lot of Johns Hopkins memories. And, and, and Coach Cole, and I know that you've interacted. I don't think you've ever – you've never played Hopkins, but you've obviously, you know, come up against the guy a lot over the years. I, I'm just blown away by this. I'm shocked. I mean, he was always big in uh, the development of lacrosse in, in Michigan, coming out here and playing into some uh, fall events. And I think he came out for a couple of clinics and so forth. Yeah, it shocked, it shocked me for sure. I remember in 1992, he came out to the Country Day Camp with uh, Tony Seaman, who was the head coach at Hopkins. And he was one of the camp counselors for all of us. And he was bigger than life then. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I saw John Paul post today, and I was a smart aleck, and I, I tweeted back at him because um, Johns Hopkins in 2007 came out to play MCLA Michigan. And Army, it was Al yeah. second year there. He came too. And it was just so unheard of that. You have a service academy and Johns Hopkins playing an MCLA team yeah. on the road in their hometown. It was legendary. I mean, that, that was yeah. one of those things that really – I remember going there with my wife and I. Um, I dragged her with me, and the place was packed. That, that, that was the biggest lacrosse event. It was bigger than the state finals. It was huge. And it was in some little area of campus. It wasn't really in a big stadium. It was outside in some parking lot, basically. Yeah, as an intramural field or something. Yeah. I think it was grass. But, um, yeah, so – um, it was the birth of Big Ten lacrosse, period. That was, if that didn't happen, there probably would be no Big Ten lacrosse, period. Yeah. End of story. Yeah. I, I, I really have respected Petro for years, and I, and I haven't reached out to Andrew Cote, but, but he wants to come on this podcast, by the way. Uh, we'll, we'll get him into the schedule. Um, but, you know, Nick Chavilla played with him, I believe. I know Cote played for him. I'd like to get some of their takes on it because I've always respected the guy, and I know that they were two and four this year, and he was on the last year of his contract. But, um, yeah, I, this is a Michigan lacrosse podcast, but Petromala yeah. stepping away from Hopkins is big news. So I just wanted to see if you guys wanted to chime in on it. Yeah, Cos I, talked to, I talked to Paul Cosgrove the other night, late night, um, and we were actually talking about Petromala because he played when, uh, when Cos was back there and Dave Morrow and, uh, and all those guys. So uh, Cosgrove, we have him on. Uh, he, was, he was pretty close with, uh, with Petromala as well. So, you know, I mean, my quick take is – yeah, I, you know, I mean, it really, they, it's just a different landscape in lacrosse. I mean, Hopkins is a blue blood, and they really haven't performed well for a number of years. Um, and I don't know if it's it's the recruiting or if it's just, you know, the, the landscape of lacrosse where the athletes are just going to different places. There's just more of them. And so the domination that Hopkins had, you know, for so many years under, under Petromala, it just hasn't happened. And so... You know, and I think there's, you know, money's probably involved too. I think Chris Colin, you can speak to that a little bit more. But you know, I'm sure, you know, he he wasn't he wasn't uh, cheap, um, just you know, with his legacy there at Hopkins. So I'm not overly, I'm not, I'm not too, too surprised. I have only one. Uh, the only thing you're seeing from David Petromala right now has nothing to do with his own situation. But everything he's putting out there is thanking people, telling people he loves them, and respecting the people around him. Uh, he is not really putting himself out there at all, yeah. but he is putting the people uh, that he has cared for out there. Which yeah. tells me uh, that's what I think the lesson you can learn about being a good coach uh, and why he's so well-respected and loved. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, when I read the um, press release, uh, you know, just my only thing that I, the only hard comment I'll say about it is what I read was you're our all time winning coach, but haven't won a big game in a long time. And, 
you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, today is the day the music died. Uh, bye bye American Pie, whatever. You know, yeah. it's uh, it's. I think it's uh, the sad state of the business of big time athletics. Um, that you would, uh, you know, it's been a couple, you know, a couple bad years uh, by their standard, and um, you know, not moving in the direction that they would want. I would, I would, would have hoped. Um, that they would have let, knowing what I know, but I'm sure that athletic director doesn't know, that now that the recruiting rules have changed, I think Hopkins did, you know, was hurt a little bit by recruiting kids in eighth grade and some of those early uh, commits that they took, some, some from Hopkins fans or Hopkins alumni and situations like that where it wasn't maybe up to the same standard, the same co competition level yeah. that the, that 2122s would have given co Hopkins back. So I, I don't know. It's, a, it's um, you know, coaching a lot of Hopkins guys this summer and getting a lot of insight in David Petromal and, and getting to coach at Homewood with him right there with a bunch of Hopkins people, you could really see the love. And um, he is definitely a man for other people. So, yeah. Yeah. So and Chris, I don't want to put you in some in an in a awkward or inappropriate position commenting on a peer at the Division One level, um, but but yeah, I, I do know that you you coached at Homewood with the Atlas this summer. I noticed Mike Costello's sweatshirt if he leans back in the camera. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, uh, so I, I'll I'll kind of wrap that up and just say I'll be curious to see if he does land in the PLL with as tight of a relationship as he does have with Paul Rabel as his former player. Um, you know, it might be a good spot for him in the future, or does he find, you know, somewhere else? As, or does he? I think he's a great call? analyst. Yeah. <laughs> I think he'd do great on TV. Yeah. Oh, he'd be I fantastic. He'd be on TV. Yeah, or he so goes think, to Chris Cole on the route and he's the JV lacrosse coach somewhere and he gets back. Uh, he's going to, yeah, he'll be a JV. He'll coach high school too, but I think as a commentator, he'd be very good. Well, well uh, Mike, comment, not Mike is commentary. Make commentary, Mike. That's what you do. So. <laughs> Yeah, he, he'd, he'd be yeah. great. I think a PLL spot would be uh, perfect for him. Yeah. How about UDM Lax? He can sit with me. I mean, me and Petra Mahal in the booth for UDM wow. Lax? you kidding wow. me? There you go. There's a guy there right there. That'd be fantastic. We'll see what we can do. So um, one of the questions that we always ask when we have a guest is, is how did you get into lacrosse? Who gave you your first stick? Mm. Uh, I think your wall and, and our buddy Liberty Provost now have one and two when it comes to the, the um, background. background, the museum, the collection, yeah. the archives. Um, how did you get your first stick? How did you first get exposed to the game? Uh, exposure to the game was back in 1977. And it was at a uh, summer camp in northern Michigan, Sheboygan to be exact. Wow. And uh, some of the counselors were, I think, current or former Michigan State lacrosse players. But uh, the camp had a uh, bunch of these wooden sticks. So that was the first introduction that I had. And interesting <laughs> aside, one of the camp directors was Don Sill, who started the Novi program. And I had, I had no idea. I don't even know if I met him when I was at camp, but I just knew he was one of the directors. Fast forward, I don't know, 30-some, 40-some odd years, and he has passed away. And I had the privilege to give his wife the Hall of Fame plaque when he was inducted into the Coach's Hall of Fame, which was kind Maybe. of a cool little path. Wow. That. So That's cool. But that was that was the first introduction. Uh, I think the first stick that I got was from official sports in Redford, out on Telegraph somewhere, and it was one of those. I don't know. It might have been a brine. All I could tell you was the, the color. It was blue. Um, that was the first stick, and I think my parents bought it for me. Okay, but you didn't like walk out of camp that night, and, and I've heard that story. I think when we went out to, to dinner or lunch at, at Vincetta Garage, we were just yeah. kind of, you know, how'd you get into it kind of thing. Um, what, what made you motivated to buy that first stick? Were you getting on a team? Were you joining a program? Were you just wanting to spool around in the backyard? Well, back in the day, uh, I think I took like two years off since that summer camp. My, my first game was tennis, so I wanted to play for Michigan State and had some letters that my tennis coach had written to the uh, head coach at Michigan State, and he basically, you know, okay, poo-pooed it. If you're not ranked in the Midwest UTA, you're not going to get too much. I, and I couldn't get even a, a preferred 
walk on. I think he said, if you want to walk on this team, you have to win the intramural tournament. That was, that was it. So there was, you know, I think I made it to the quarterfinals and that was the end of the whole tennis thing. But a buddy of mine was uh, walking on, or back then at Michigan State, they weren't, they weren't great. They weren't terrible, but they weren't, they weren't great. They were playing Ohio State, Notre Dame in the Midwest. And a friend of mine who had played, he had gone to this camp for, I don't know, a number of years, and he had played a while, he says he was going to try and walk on. And I said, wow, uh, my tennis dream is now deferred. I'm going to give it a try as well. So that's when I got the stick. And, you know, they didn't make any cuts back then. They needed, they needed all the bodies they could get that time. So uh, we ended up being one of, you know, 40 some odd kids that were on that Michigan State team in 1979, 1980. And that was, uh, that was the first year and then, you know, played the following year and then, uh, remember the movie The Natural? Oh, of course, uh, yeah. yeah. Roy Hobbs. Yeah, he, he took some time off. That's kind of where I was. I, I took some time off after uh, 1981 to you know, 2000. You didn't get shot, did you, or anything like no, that? No, no, not, not quite that dramatic. <laughs> so and who on that 79, 80, 81 teams do you know that, that is still involved in the game of lacrosse in Michigan? Because I know a lot of those old state programs have some of those legendary guys that have just been kicking around the game forever. Yeah, well, uh, the coaches at that time were Nevin Canner and Boku Hendrickson. And Rich Kimball was a grad assistant that, that year. And then he, was, he became the head coach the following year. But uh, let's see, Sean Grady, who was yeah. coach with Alchemist. Yeah. John Lametti was on that team, who was, who was at Rice. Yeah, he was my, one of my coaches at one yeah. point. Yep. Uh, Chuck Hewitt, who was the first coach at, or second coach at Bay City Central, I believe. Uh, let's see. Uh, and there were there were a bunch of kids that that came from uh, New England area that played, and we had some uh, Lance Cruz kids that played on that team. Art Berry, Terry By, I think they were before, obviously before your guys' time. But uh, cool. The interview that you guys did uh, last week with Coach Kimball that was great. Watch that and just uh, interesting memories. That was that was fun fun to watch. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. We got a lot of feedback on that one. I've heard from a lot of people saying, oh, and, and, you know, we, we were a little worried because it was running long. It was the longest one we've had. And, uh, you know, we were like, oh, well, time, you know, we're always watching the clock, try to keep it an hour. But everyone was happy about it because we got into we, we got into some good stuff. And the funny thing is we're not even, you know, we're not even scratching the surface of the stuff we can get in that I think you can probably get into and go much right. deeper. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but, yeah, it was interesting. Well, it's funny because every one of these conversations that we do spurns more conversations. So, you know, there's an example in every one. We talked to Jen Dunbar, and he puts us to make sure we got to talk to Mike Emery. And then Mike Emery tells us who we got to talk to. Or, you know, we talk to um, Tony Quinn, who says we got to talk to Liberty. And then Liberty sends me an email with 20 more things he wants to talk about next time yeah. he comes on. Um, and so I posted the Rich Kimball one in a guy that I hated. I, I played against Doug Jolly for three years, Mike Jolly's son, and I covered him a lot. We hated each other. Like, we – part of that whole rivalry thing, we were oil and water. Um, over the last year or so, seeing tweets from him, seeing tweets from me, liking, commenting back and forth. Um, now consider him friendly, consider him a friend. Posted the Kimball episode, and he and I spent an hour and a half probably yesterday in a Twitter DM conversation about mm -hmm. the 92 season, Michigan State dropping lacrosse, me transferring up to Michigan State. You know, my, like, it's just, there's been so much of, while we, as we keep saying, we don't have lacrosse games, we have lacrosse. It's right. really been a lot of fun with this to, to connect with people. And, 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 and selfishly, we, we're doing this to promote U.S. lacrosse Michigan. We're not talking to everybody that's a U.S. Lacrosse member. We probably should. We're not talking to people that require everyone in the program to be U.S. Lacrosse members. We probably should. But we're just trying to get people having conversations on this. So yeah. I want to use that as a transition to I'm looking at Costello Communications and the All Across Michigan, you know, yeah. posters above you. Yeah. You've been player, coach, dad, 
teacher, Hall of Fame. But, but today you're a journalist. Today you're covering lacrosse in and around Michigan for all across Michigan. Do you have a journalistic background? How did you get involved with this? Or were you just one of those guys that went, yeah, this will be fun? All right. Well, I'll give you some context. Uh, sounds good. Okay. Uh, back, in, back in 2002 when uh, my daughter was born, and she was off to school, and I really didn't have, uh, she would say, anything to do. So I was kind of like, well, what, what am I going to do? And she said, why don't you find a job? Well, okay, uh, let's, how can I integrate lacrosse with writing and photography and so forth? So I decided to uh, start a website. And in a search, I found this examiner company out of Denver, and they were looking for um, local people to write stories for the, the cities that they were in. And I, mine was the Ann Arbor Lacrosse Examiner. So I would write stories on uh, the fall tournaments and I went out and covered uh, UAD practices and things like that. And uh, what I found was they had uh, some advertising that I really didn't want to be associated with. It's kind of like, you know, bikini stuff. It just wasn't what I wanted people to see and, and equate all across Michigan or, or lacrosse with this. So my wife said, you know, why don't you start your own website? And I said, oh, okay, that's, that sounds like a, a reasonable idea. So started all across Michigan and uh, was looking for advertising dollars. And there were some clubs that kind of uh, pitched in, but then there was a few companies that uh, really bailed me out when it was a little little iffy. Uh, they would do a monthly uh, advertising contract and uh, actually now that I think about it they were it was 3D out of, out of Denver which is kind of ironic that they were the ones that kind of came through in a big way to kind of get me through that that spot. So now I'm working full-time and it's really not not about advertising dollars anymore it's just I'm just I'm just doing it and loving it. The love of doing it. Yeah. I, I mean, cool. I, I've had so much fun on the sidelines taking pictures of all games from high school to the PLL. And I got to tell you with, with Chris here, that, that game in Hamilton, those games in Hamilton were just fantastic. And uh, my daughter got a chance to be on the field and, you know, go through and see behind the scenes. It was you know, it's one of those things that's going to be a memory for yeah. life. And it was, it was just awesome. You mean Chris's niece? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, Man, you, I don't you know what you're talking about. about. Yeah, good. <laughs> that was good. No, I, I didn't get anybody on the field. Yeah. <laughs> nay, heal that. Yeah. Oops, sorry. I, I have one really good Costello covering a game story. Should I, should I save it for later or should I tell it now? I, I don't know. I don't know which one it is. Um... Regional final CC versus South Lion, maybe out at Wild Lake. Yeah, my wife dropping my keys off. You oh, were in the yeah. parking lot. <laughs> I remember that one. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell it quickly. Okay, um, getting ready for the game. And I was it CC South Lion, CC maybe, probably CC one, CC one. I, I, I can yeah. tell you that. Um, and I think it was 2018, so it, w it would have been their championship year. It was Heartland. Heartland, Heartland was 18 because Heartland hit the post uh, to win it, and then it went into overtime, and CC won in overtime. It, no, it was it – was, Or 17. It wasn't a semifinal. I think it was a quarterfinal maybe. The regional final, so the quarterfinal. Yeah. yeah. That was probably South Lion. Anyways, it's me, Bob Bowery, Tony Durashai, Tony D are, are the three refs in the game. <laughs> and you get there hour, 45 minutes early – I'll get your cars together and you start changing going through your pregame. Points of emphasis, experience with the, all the kind of stuff. Well, the way that we're parked, Bowery's in the middle, I'm on the left, Tony's on the right. All three of us have pickup trucks. And, and so we're kind of opening, closing doors, getting in and out, trying to have a conversation with all of us. I don't know if Bob closed my door. I don't know if I bumped the lock button, but I <laughs> go around my truck to the side. I'm now fully dressed, but I need my hat, my belt, my timer, my whistle, my glasses, all that stuff. Doors locked. Go back around, doors locked. 
I'm locked out of my truck. We, we're about to have a regional final, and I don't have any of my stuff. It's your fault. It, it, totally. <laughs> so Bob Bowery being Bob, don't panic. Don't panic. <laughs> we got that. Bob, I'm not what freaked out. I got to come pick me up, but I, we got a game to do. So it, it's like stone soup. Bowery's got an extra belt. Tony D's got a flag. Uh, Bob's got a whistle. There's a hat. We, we piecemeal enough together that – we can go out and do the game. But two things. One, I've got to call my wife and say, I know you're home with two, a two-year-old, a seven-year-old, and an eight-year-old, but I need you to drive my extra keys out here. And when you get here, I need you to call this number. Actually, after our pregame with the coaches and the captains and the coin toss, I ran over and called her from Mike's cell phone. Yeah. said, honey, can you please call this cell phone? When you get here, Mike will run out and grab the keys from you. Um, so we go out and we do the first half. And I'll never forget this because um, I can see pretty well when it's not dark. But if it would have been a night game without these, I would have been screwed. <laughs> now, it was a night game, but the sun hadn't come down yet. So mm. halftime, Mike's there taking pictures, run over, grab my keys from him. We do our halftime referees meeting at our cars where I grab my glasses, I get my timer, I, you know, we, we kind of covered for all this stuff and how are we going to do counts and, and, and everything, get my flags, everything. Get back out there, we, we go out to start the second half, and I walk by Craig McMichael, uh, the assistant coach at CC, and he looks at me and goes, were you wearing glasses in the first half? Right. <laughs> yeah. it, 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 was, uh, it, it was the first time that, that a fan yelled, get some glasses. That was actually <laughs> legitimate. Yeah, I know, I'm trying. But no, I've I've run into Mike at God, you name it, UDM games, Michigan games, women's games, boo bashes, lax bashes, cherry bombs. Uh, um, you know, it, it's Everywhere. just been uh, uh, you've been omnipotent. You've, you've been everywhere when it comes to this kind of stuff. Um, what's kind of your, your your favorite stuff to cover? What's your favorite stuff to do when it comes to this? Yeah, so, you know, some of those some of those times, it's just fun making the trip. I covered a, I think it was an Alma, Alma Albion game, driving up to Alma to cover the game. I just like getting to those, you know, different destinations. It's, it's nice to get away from say, ah, just going out to CC or Pioneer or whatever, cover games out in, in Grand Rapids and Alma and Albion. It, it's fun just to make a little road trip. Yeah. I don't think I'd like to go you know, four to six hours there and back, but I suppose I, I could. We got to get you to see Liberty up in Traverse City. He'd love to have you. He'd host you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, I like, uh, I like being on the sidelines because it's, you get to hear a lot of stuff that, you know, a lot of the, the parents or fans don't necessarily hear. And you also get to hear the fans and the parents too, which is, it cracks me up. And I don't know how officials deal with it all the time because it cracks me up. I can understand when, when coaches get at get on an official, but when the parents and some of the stuff that they say, I just have to shake my head and go, oh, boy, you got to just, just be quiet. But being on the silence and then hearing the, the, guys, the guys talk and just realizing how much conversation goes on on the field. And as a coach, you know, dealing with high school kids who tend to be – a little bit quieter. I mean, you have to say, listen, you, these guys are talking all the time. Yeah. Offense, defense, yes. you, you've got to, you've got to get that in your uh, systems that you're that you're talking and communicating. I don't have to deal with that anymore, but I mean, I used to do that. Yeah. Um, have you t you announced that you were going to retire from Ann Arbor Green Hills at the end of last season? Yeah. You already were not coming back to coach. Right. I assume that you still had underclassmen that are still there that have been in communication with. How's, how's the Green Hills team doing right now without lacrosse? Uh, talk to a senior who – my heart goes out to him because he lost, I think, two years due to injury. Mm. So he played, I think, uh, sophomore and junior year. This would have been his senior year. And he's, he's dealing with it okay. I think they, they had two seniors – that were on the team. He's, he's doing okay. He, he's a great kid. Uh, he had, you know, I told him that his, his career was more quality, not quantity. Cause when he was on the field, he was, he was really good and he appreciated that. And he told me he's going to remember that 
you know, as he goes forward, that just that line that it's quality, not quantity. And then there's, there's a junior that I, that I talked to. He's, he's really bummed out. Uh, But, you know, he had uh, a brother that, that played uh, last year, last year was his senior year, but, you know, they can carry on that Catholic league championship for another, another year, which is, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah. You did go out on a high note, which was nice. That's very, very true. Yeah. So we always joke about Coach Colin's career, and he says when he's done as a D1 coach, he's going to referee and he's going to be a JV head coach of a boys team in high school. Yeah. Is this girls team? Girls. Okay. <laughs> is this it for you, or is this wait until Rachel gets off to school? What What do you think? Uh, I don't know. I think that – for the next 40 years, I just want to enjoy her college career and uh, probably maybe piecemeal some goalie coach coaching in, in those four years, uh, maybe working with Chris Marucci and the Triumph Girls. I've been doing that for, I don't know, the last five or six years. And it's fun now watching the, the girls that uh, you know, I've coached. They're all – they're all going to play collegiately, which is like, wow, it's, it's awesome. I think three or four already. There's, there's one that's playing at Madonna that I've worked with. So it's kind of, it, it's, really, it's really fun to see them stick with it, like it, improve, and improve to a level that they can actually play at a, in college. That's yeah. awesome. rewarding for sure. That's cool. So with, with with the last helping out Marucci for the last few years, have you been coaching within his travel program as at events and in games, or, or just kind of being yeah. an auxiliary helping out? A um, little bit of both. Okay. Uh, I you know some for most of the summer tournaments, I would warm up the goalies, and then take pictures, and then warm them up at halftime, and then take pictures, and then work with them and talk to them throughout the game. So I was kind of a coach with a camera, which is which is a lot of fun. You get to be on yeah. the sidelines. Sounds perfect. Some great pictures. Sounds perfect. Yeah. And then and then coach the girls. So and then also uh, just another uh, set of eyes, somebody that has uh, some knowledge about about the game and just kind of talk about what the other team's doing, what we need to do, that sort of thing. So a little more quality control kind of stuff. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, how's Rachel doing right now without having a season? Because I, I, I've kind of watched her, you know, yeah. through your Facebook account grow up through all this stuff. Um, and goalies are a little weird. So, and I mean, it is, you know. Sure. Yeah. Um, how's Rachel doing? For the, you know, for the last three years, because PCA has not had a lacrosse team, it's been okay. I mean, she's played other sports. She, she plays uh, tennis in the fall basketball in the winter and this year she was going to try and do uh three sports she was going to do uh soccer play goalie as a soccer goalie golf which is her number one sport and she was going to do uh track and field a couple of field events so she's bummed because number one she doesn't get get a chance to hang out with her friends which is probably the number one issue uh and she doesn't get a chance to play these these sports that you know she she really likes and would have liked to have tried. So as far as lacrosse goes, she's not missing it now. But, you know, if it gets to a point where that summer season or some of that training is not available, say June, July, it's going to be an issue. But she's got to get ready for fall ball. for yeah. So she's got to, uh, they'll be sending her the uh, conditioning routine. And, uh, I, th- I think they want her out to uh, some of the um, summer events, whether it's a prospect day or just getting the recruits on campus to, to work out. So I think she's, she's got something to look forward to, which is good. Uh, but right now she's just bummed that she's not able to have her senior year. Yeah, it's rough. It's, it's such a unique situation for with, you know, not playing high school ball for an MHSAA team and yet still getting recruited to go play in the NAIA. 
So it's, it's, it's quite a testament to her work ethic and, and the, the Triumph program that, that she got to, to get some eyeballs on that. Or was Dad just reaching out to everybody that he know asking for field passes to take pictures and then saying, oh, by the way, my daughter's a goalie? No, no, no. It wasn't, no wasn't she's terrible. awesome. Come on. But, <laughs> she's good. But that, uh, you know, there's this, there's this conversation, and I don't know if you want to go this route, uh, club versus high school. Yeah. And especially in the girls' game. And I've watched a, a, a ton of girls lacrosse, high school games, and then a ton of club games. Mm -hmm. And the way the girls' landscape is here in Michigan, it's almost, almost, almost not even, unless you're playing for, say, Rockford or East Grand Rapids or Cranbrook, it's sometimes it's, it's better to just play on a club where you have girls that are uh, serious about the game, will invest the time in practice, and you have girls that can actually pass and catch. Yeah. And do those things versus high school where you might have three or four girls that are have stick skills and the rest are still learning. Right. So it's like, wow, the games are totally different. Totally yeah. different. And watching all these, these really elite teams on, on the, the summer circuit they're phenomenal. But then you go back and you watch some of the Michigan high school games. It's like night and day. Oh, this is not. This is not good. Yeah, it's it's completely night and day because the the three girls with that sticks have the six skills. They they don't want to throw it to the other girls because they're not going to catch it. And yeah. so they end up playing a three man or two man game the whole game. Yeah. And it's just it's not lacrosse. It's not what it's meant to be. From uh, you know the 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 purity of the women's game, um, right. you know is is about that. Yeah, I mean, you're watching uh, one girl run at 80 yards, right? And that's that's it. They shoot, and there we are. But played at, at the highest level, I mean, it's it's a phenomenal right. watch. It's it's a, it's a blast. Yeah, my daughter's going to be a freshman next year, and so I'm kind of going through that conversation. Um, you know, really that thought process of what are we going to do? She's going to go to Mercy next year, which you know has had some good programs, and and yeah. I think uh, their their varsity coach is uh, works with the Triumph program as well. So. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it should be it should be fun moving over to that. Um, you know, having that as well with with Rice in high school too. So it'll be fun. Can, can quick you guys see my sidebar? No, it's not showing, Chris. Yeah, I was quick si oh, there it is. Oh, oh, oh. Quick no. sidebar uh, with the Petromala stuff today. The WPLL decided not to play this summer. I really? thought the WPLL was just an amazing product for women's lacrosse. I agree. That mm -hmm. le the level of play, the athleticism, and the, the ball control, and, and the looseness of the rules, you know, letting the girls be a little more aggressive. Yeah. Uh, I thought that product was going to just move the game Ugh. so That's much. And, and, and I thought this year would be a lot bigger. They would actually, the WPLL would have a much bigger jump than the PLL uh, percentage-wise, but they just canceled it. That's so, a bummer. Yeah, it's a bummer. So, Mike, one of the things that we always – or that I always kind of push this conversation towards is is the role of U.S. lacrosse's Michigan chapter in supporting players, coaches, officials, parents. Um, I remember you and I at – again, we, we had lunch at Vincetta Garage, yeah. and, and they've got that butcher paper on the table, and we had Sharpies out and were making lists on the, the tablecloth yeah. Of, of guys that we thought should be doing more or that we should be recruiting to do more or, or that could help with the conversation and some of this stuff. Because remember this, it was tournaments and, and the, the, the travel teams were starting to blow up in and, and high school versus youth. And, and you know, this, this was this goes like 12, 12 years, 10 years, maybe. I don't remember. Yeah. Um, what do you think – and give me whatever tough love you think I need to hear or we need to hear at U.S. Lacrosse or specifically the U.S. Lacrosse Michigan chapter. What are we not getting done? Where do we have to get involved and who do we have to get involved? Who? Not sure. But let's start with – there are three things that, that I would like to see that uh, the chapter has done in the past. Way back when, I think it was the, the Bob Stevenson, Clark Bell era, they did a – uh, a clinic for men and women, officials, coaches, whoever, at Concordia in Ann Arbor. And they had classrooms and they had uh, a big uh, vendor area and they invited whoever wanted to go. It was kind of like a local 
uh, lacrosse convention. And there were speakers, and I thought that was great. And it was, for those that couldn't go to Baltimore or Philadelphia, I thought it was a great opportunity to get some instruction, uh, meet some people. Uh, and I thought that was great. So I'd love to see something like that. Uh, second thing, bring back, all right, all right, four things. Uh, second thing, bring back the, uh, the showcase for the seniors, boys and girls. That'd be awesome. Uh, and I know that that has some issues as far as uh, players and their responsiveness and wanting to play. Some are already committed to a summer team, things like that. But I think it, I think it would be good for that. Also, the fall 7-on-7 uh, seven seven tournament, that was, that was pretty good. I, I think the kids liked like that, and I know that it's, it's somewhat saturated. But that I think everybody looked forward to that U.S. Lacrosse seven on seven, yeah. Um, and then the the Hall of Fame, and I know um, in the past it was in Birmingham, and it was somewhat well attended, and it seemed like it happened every year, and then it just kind of fell away for a number of years. So those are the four things that I think were really big. Uh, big events that I think everybody looked forward to. And I think that got some people to uh, talk about it and just know that the, uh, the chapter was active. Yeah. yeah. When did the seniors go away? When did that, I don't, I don't really remember that. U.S. Lacrosse had a, like a senior game that, that uh, for Michigan. All star game, senior yeah, showcase. Country Day, right? Well, the first year was a pioneer. And then, a pioneer, yeah. Yeah, and then it went, moved to Country Day and – they had the girls' game like eleven o'clock, and the boys' game at one. And then that's when they inducted uh, the Hall of Fame. Uh, we both did the Hall of Fame uh, inductions, and then they also had the U.S. Lacrosse uh, scholarship winners. I, you know, it was really good, and it was it was well attended. I thought. I mean, there was a lot of parents and fans, and it's one last opportunity for the seniors. Cool. To play and, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll run that. Thing. We broadcast it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we could do it at U of D. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I refed it one year with uh, Matt Dekatowski, I remember. I drove out there with Deco, and I want to say it was somewhere like uh, a Novi or a Walled Lake or something this year. I don't remember. When was the last was. one? When was the last one? Because I, I don't even remember. You know, when I got involved, I, I, I don't remember. I mean. It's been a couple years. It, it, I, I, the one that I refed, I want to say, was back in like 08, 09, somewhere in there. Um, and again, this is one of those where just you get a phone call from Clark Bell and goes, hey, uh, you know, we're not going to assign this through um, Ricky Jackson, who's the assigner at the time. We're just going to get some some USL members. We'll throw you 50 bucks and, and buy you lunch. Um, I remember it was hot because that, that's after the state finals and everything. I know yeah. that a couple of the issues that – and I was even talking to uh, Jason Gratson, who's the, the treasurer uh, of USL. He still thinks he has a box of pennies somewhere for <laughs> – Home, way, east, west, D1, D2. Um, the challenge that they ran into was was getting the kids to commit yeah. because they tried to wait until after the state finals. Um, and then they got so deep into high school graduation party season and, yeah. and getting guys saying, I'd love to play, but it's my party today, or I'd love to play, it's my best friend's party, or, or whatever. Um, you had some guys that were going on to college that were just like, hey, I, uh, I'm not going to risk the injury. Um, you know, you had some of those kids. I remember talking to some of the Rice kids. I, I want to say it was Will Meter. I was busting his chops one year. And he was like, man, I'm tired. I, I'm playing at Michigan next year. And I, I just ran through four seasons under Ambrose. Like, I need a break. Um, and, and he was very polite about it. And he wasn't trying to be, be a brood or, 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 you know, chicken out of me. He just said, I just – state finals, we wanted to throw my gloves in the air. And now I'm going to take a break. Um, so, so, I mean, my thought, I mean, you look at it like the, you know, the Super Bowl, right? They, they do the Pro Bowl the week before the Super Bowl and just whoever's in the Super Bowl doesn't play in that game. Um, you know, I mean, the thought would be, what if you had it, you know, Friday, the Friday night before the state final, or, you know, somewhere around that or before the state finals and, 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 and whoever, you know, the final four teams for the boys just don't play in it. Great idea, I mean, John. I, I mean, I, I think that. I think that those players, I mean, if they're getting to that level, you're going to have D1. I mean, you're going to have a lot of good players, obviously, when we look back historically. And I think it would mean more to those other kids whose season just ended 
that would be like, cool, this is one more thing. And it's, and it's really a give back because a lot of those kids, you talk about the All-American discussion, you talk about the All-State discussions. So now you really have your own thing that's kind of cool to really celebrate some of the other guys rather than the Rice kids or the CC kids or the Forest Hills Central. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I think that would be kind of cool. Good idea. So I'll say this. When I went to the um, MHSLCA Hall of Fame induction a couple months ago, um, I was sitting at a table with Ron Hebert, who we've got to get on here eventually. Uh, he's um, hitting me up on Facebook now just to let you know to get on the show. So we, we got to get him on. because we got to get him on here. We, we could do a – like I, I made the joke the one time. We could do a 100-part series on lacrosse in Michigan with Ron with his experience, his knowledge, his, you know, everything. Um, but I, I was sitting at a table with Ron and Jamal uh, Robertson, um, mm-hmm. Jim Carl – um, Greg Norman was there, um, and I just kind of leaned over to Jim Carl and I said, whatever happened to the All-Star game? And, and he went, ah, eh, well, you know, that just kind of fell apart. And so I started sending some emails. We were actually starting the discussion to see if this year we might be able to, to resurrect it or at least resurrect the conversation to have a selection process and a plan in place for 2021 mm-hmm. at the very least. Um, some of the USL board members, you know, like Jason said, I think I still got a box of jerseys. Um, there's definitely some of the logistics that came up with, well, this didn't happen, that didn't happen. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with, with Mike and the fact that if, if we could announce the players early enough, announce the Hall of Fame members early enough, let the MHSLCA announce their Hall of Fame members, we announce the USL Hall of Famers, you know, get, get whatever entities, bodies are involved – even invite the MHSAA if they want to come out and do anything. You know, it, it, it was a fun day, and it got those guys uh, – I, I can't remember his name – big, big, strong face-off kid out of Novi that had a good career at Michigan State. Um, Jeff Nicholson. Yeah, yeah. He was on that game, and he was playing for Sean Grady, and I dinged him for jumping or something once. And he looked up at me like, really? It's an all-star game? And Grady lost it on me, and I looked at him like, "Really? It's an all-star game." So it was a fun experience. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that's one that that we can get the right people to have the right conversations to see how we might be able to bring it back. Mike, I'm going to need some of your help with the MHLCA guys to make sure we talk to the right people. Okay, um, we're going to have to get a hold of the, the women's coaches to make sure that that the whole selection process and everything is is articulated. But yeah. I, yeah, Chris Marucci can help definitely with, with the, uh, the women's game. And the girls were great, too. I remember covering those, and I think they didn't have a lot of, they didn't have a lot of girls. So it was, I think they played a seven-on-seven, seven, kind of a full field. So, I, you know, I'm like 10 yards into the field taking pictures, which I normally would not do. Yeah. But Tara Chelios had a behind-the-back shot. I mean, it was, it was great. I mean, so I think that – need to have the, the girls represented for sure. Well, it, it, and I'm a big proponent of what the MHSAA has done and how their people work, but I don't think they're perfect. And, and I think too often the regional finals, the state finals for boys and girls, same sport, different locations, same time. To, I've hated that. I, I, I think that both of them would be better attended because of how many – you know, how many times has Rockford had a team in both the men's and women's finals? Or, or the Brother Ice is there, CeCe's there, Mercy's there, Marion's there, Sacred Heart's there, and you've got these families where I guess mom and grandma are going here and dad and grandpa are going here. I, I yeah. hate that. Every year. If there's in the last three years. I mean, I know, I know Rice, you know, with, with Marion, um, mm-hmm. you know, and Cranbrook too. Yeah. So you got, you got, you got dual especially, but – yeah, I mean, it's, it's just silly. I mean, you, you know, to showcase it, and, and I put this out there, you know, last year on Twitter that got a lot of a lot of pub where I laid out all the, um, you know, the state final sites within the state of Michigan, you know, Breslin and, you know, Ford Field, and you get down to the bottom and it's, uh, you know, the middle school out in Howell. Howell Parker Middle School. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and it's just, you know, I mean, optically, it just it doesn't celebrate the sport like you could. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, the other ones that you mentioned, specifically the seven on seven, I, I know that the issue with that one was that the fields got damaged one year because there was rain the weekend of that event. Yeah. yeah. They tried to book it the next year. The cities or the, the parks or whatever said, uh-uh, the, the fields still haven't recovered yeah. from the damage last year. 
Mm -hmm. um, and by then it was too late to try to find an event location. And then a for-profit or two stepped in and said, well, we've got a tournament and it, it dissipated. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so the so problem I, with tournaments is there's people that run tournaments full time. So coaches, organizations that used to do things kind of uh, a little bit cheaper and, you know, just for opportunities have gone to the wayside because the professionals are better. You know, they're better mm -hmm. at running tournaments. They're better at organizing stuff. They, you know, um, so I think that's where, you know, even, you know, uh, I used to do a seven on seven, but uh, you know it wasn't as well run as some of the professional ones. So, tournament, you know, guys that are running the summer stuff are going to go to the professional places. Do it on Sunday after the state finals, man. I mean, that's... everything else Mike said, I, I I'm a hundred percent on board with. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, you know, the, the Hall of Fame one was great because it was at Peabody's on on yeah. Woodward, and now Peabody's yeah. has been knocked down, and they've. God knows what's been constructed but there. So the Zonky, well, this is Zonkies. They sold out, and they would give uh, Peabody's for free. That's why. Yeah. So yeah, the last one I attended was the Ambrose one. Yeah, the Peabody's. That was, that was well, no, and then the 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 Cosgrove induction was that, was that U.S. Lacrosse? Yeah, yeah, that was yeah, U.S. Right. Lacrosse. Yeah, that yeah, was over on the east side somewhere. Yeah, uh, is it Ro Rochester Road and like uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And that one was well attended because when we decided to you know, select that class, you've got Kaz and Chevello who are both absolutely deserving teammates, friends. We knew that, you know, the entire 1984 through 89 Brother Ice Lacrosse program would come out and attend it. Um, Chris Colin was there. John Paul was there. We had a number of former, you know, Rich Kimball. It was, it was well attended, um, but really it was because we had those specific guys that were part of a team that, that, you know, Shavilla flew up from Florida for it. Cosgrove's obviously here in town. Um, and it went until and it went until four in the morning too, as well. So. <laughs> well, we left and went to Bills on Woodward. <laughs> yeah, and I remember finally looking over and guys, got, no, 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 I'm I'm driving. No, well, that's that's Nick. That's Shavilla's uh, Shavilla's uh, brother-in-law. So yeah, we closed the door and uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's his sister's it private party. Yeah, uh, it was a blast though. It was it was a lot of fun just hearing those guys and telling stories and, and everything. Uh, Dwayne Hicks has kind of taken the, the lead on the Hall of Fame and putting a committee together. So we've kind of now put in, in we're trying to put in some policies that says, okay, if we're gonna induct you as a coach, you should at least have this on your resume. Or, or if you're gonna be an official, did you ref a state final? Have you won a state championship? Is your winning record there? We've done a great job of getting the influencers and the legends of the game. Um, and I got to give Jamal Robertson credit. He's got uh, a three, four page Word document that we now have as a Google Sheet listing people that you've forgotten about that, you know, played at Cranbrook and played at Penn or, or were a Division Three All American or, or, you know, some of these people, we know the Zonkies, we know the, the Perkovics, we know the, those guys, but, but people that really had an outstanding collegiate career after you know, coming from Michigan that, that we haven't inducted. So um, we're trying to put together a little more structure around that. And, and, and again, uh, like this year, the induction ceremony was the same weekend as that um, Country Day Can-Am, the event at Country Day, the Can-Am Showcase. Mm -hmm. And my buddy Bob Bowery was inducted. And, and I know Graham Adams Sr. came in town for that. And all the refs are going to be there. And I'm going, I got a game at Country Day at 8 in the morning the morning after this thing. I'm not going out and how, you know, with those boys until, and I, I took the wuss way out and I saw some of the refs there the next day and, you know, they were, they were there as observers or trainers or whatever, not the guys in the field. But, um, yeah, I, I think we want to try to figure out a way to make some of these events community events to, to, to get some more promotion like this podcast for that U.S. Lacrosse Michigan is out there. Um, and as far as the, the, the local convention, um, I've got to give Bryce Woodson, who's our Midwest USL representative, a lot of credit. He and I have been on the phone, not weekly, but I'd say bi-weekly, having conversations with groups on the west side of the state that want to have their own type of, of Milo League. Um, he was on the phone today with the group down in uh, – Bellevue, um, Grosseal, Tecumseh, those guys about trying to help them organize their youth leagues. We want to get coaches development programs more attended. We want to do more for officials recruitment. Um, and, and we have friends, uh, there's a, a women's official and a U.S. lacrosse um, 
member that, that is with the Lansing Sports Commission. That's his job to book events like that. Um, you know, I remember driving to the press box at Spartan Stadium for a, a USL planning meeting once. Um, it was really cool because we were up there overlooking the field and somebody had the ability to get a Spartan Stadium uh, as our meeting room. I, I think we could do something really cool in mid-Michigan where the Liberty guys can caravan down from up north. Mm -hmm. um, the, the east side can get there in an hour and a 15 minutes. The west side can get there quickly. Uh, and like you said, if we let every Stinson Meller and Lax Monkey and whoever else set up a tent for, for uh, in a gym somewhere for a couple of bucks, um, I know absolutely 100% in my brain that Chris Colin would come out and do a coach's clinic. Um, I'm sure that that uh, 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 Brian Eppinger would be willing to do something on on, on the program. Um, Jake Decola likes to do that that stuff too. I mean, he he loves to. Yeah. Know. Would Mike Castello take pictures? Is the big question. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I would just There's be no there. Question. There's no question. There's no question. Broadcaster be there as a personality. I'll just have my own booth and just sit there and talk to people. Sign autographs. Like, we got to talk a little all, all across Michigan a little bit. <laughs> I am shocked that John Losey has not asked for the Losey's locker room column to be added to all across mm. Michigan. Yeah. We, we have dabbled. We have dabbled, but we've never gone uh, a, a full circle. I, I pulled out the old Losey's locker room from the Albion College plea ad as I was pulling out boxes the other day. And, uh, that was fun. Yeah. That's been, that's been one of the quarantine things is going through the, the old uh, boxes of photos. And Chris, I've got that uh, big lacrosse box of, of old newspapers and programs and from 2002 and just everything in between. So it's. Uh, Are you going to digitize it all or what? Uh, oh no, that would drive me crazy. I could not do that. A few, Micro, a few microfish. I've got. Microfish. <laughs> microfish. The, yeah. the 1991 Scholastic uh, Championship book, uh, both, I mentioned my conversation with Doug Jolly. I was going through rosters trying to remember names of guys that we covered or that, that he was covered by or, or whatever. Then Mike Cahill's picking my brain, the old Farmington coach, yeah. about, about that, that three to two game and Jerome Quinn and who was the other attackman out there with, you know, like we, we would just been having fun with this because we've been quarantined and, you know, why not? Um, Getting back to the all across Michigan, and everyone should follow Mike on Twitter and, and on his you, Facebook. Yeah. He he does a really good job. I think everybody stuff. already does. No, no. How, how many are how many members, Chris, are there for the uh, U.S. Mich uh, Michigan chapter? About seventy five hundred. Uh, I'm not even close to that. Well, our own Facebook really? page only has about seven hundred and fifty followers, so we got a ways to go too. Okay, all right. Um, but your your rankings, doing them. While you were coaching, yeah, did anyone ever call you out or 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 beat you in a game and, and reference it like that? That was a little cocky to be doing rankings while you were a coach. We never played top ten teams. It's always fair. Yeah. Well, I mean, we uh, you know we played uh, some really good teams in in the tournament, but we would never. I mean, our regular season schedule was you know Catholic League. Our, our toughest opponents usually were. Gabriel Richard in yeah. that in that division. So, uh, but no, I I think the the biggest uh, stuff that I got back was I think I picked Tecumseh to beat Country Day when Dylan Day was with Tecumseh and they were you know really good and I figured ah eh, you know what and Country Day was kind of five hundred at that at that time I said ah eh, I'll pick Tecumseh man I got railed by country days kids they put that on the on the bulletin board and i think they ended up winning by two or something and they were all like so mike i went to that game because you wrote that article yeah and ended up seeing fernando who i think he went like 90 percent in the game yeah and recruited the kid because of that article because i went and saw the kid wow because of the article so there we go there you go i'm shocked i thought you had a much bigger I mean, you're, it's the, kind of the hub for the high school lacrosse, right? I mean, if I, you want to kind of go for centralized I like location. To, I like to uh, think so. I mean, information. I, I'm the one, I think I'm the one site that has original content where I'm going out right. and showing original photographs and writing original articles and doing my own interviews, doing my own rankings, doing all that. Yeah. 
So, yeah, I think I, mean, I, I would have, think uh, every high school kid playing should go there. No, I and kind of look for I information there. And they would love to see <laughs> see me on the sidelines. Oh, get a picture of me. I mean, there's some characters yeah. that will do that. A wave yeah. and everything. That's kind of fun, but you know, there's all these ten day challenges. Post ten huh. days of you as a coach or as a ref. Mm-hmm. I'm just going through the photos that Mike's emailed me over the last ten years. Yeah, that's true. I do. I I make sure that you're covered. Always gets a couple of the refs. We appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Um, is there anything that you have not done with all lacrosse Michigan that you do want to do? Whether it be live streaming games, podcasting, um, rankings, uh, uh, rankings committee, a- anything that you're really wanting to scratch the surface on still? Um, wow. Guest writers. Guest writers. I've had a few that covered some stuff. Uh, Greg McMichael covered the uh, Hall of Fame thing because I was out actually shooting a live game, and I'm so glad with all this is going on. I was a- actually at a, at a game. Um, Guest writers are, are great. I, I would love to do that. But I've, I've covered games in uh, Philadelphia and Hamilton and all over for the, the, girls, the girls' games. Uh, wouldn't mind going to Hawaii to cover that or cover the Vail <laughs> tournament. That'd be fun. Well, you know, Clark Bell did Vail forever. He was the official photographer at Vail. Yeah. So, you know, reach out to him and see if he's looking for a second camera on some of that stuff. Yeah. Or um, see if Colin will drag you to Las Vegas with him for some of his recruiting events out there. <laughs> yeah, Mike, I'll, uh, I, would, uh, I can get you in touch with some of the folks from uh, Lake Placid. I think that would be a fun one for you to take. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'd, like to see the pic- I'd like to see the pictures you come back with. Yeah, that'd be fun. Lake Placid's gorgeous. It's such an amazing town. Yeah. So do, we t- do we talk about the MHSA and where we are? And I mean, I, I got to tell you guys, real. I mean, I'm having conversations with coaches right now as as things start to change towards reopening the state of Michigan. Um, that people that there are coaches now that are kind of reaching out to me, going, "Hey, what do you know? What do you think? What are you gonna do as it relates to Rice?" Um, I don't know. I mean, I think there's a lot more positive vibes going in that direction. I just don't think the MHSA is going to allow us to do anything. I don't know, Mike. What's your thought? I, I don't. I don't think so. I think you know, with with the whole edict that the schools are are shuttered for the year, even if uh, all the bans are lifted, say as early as May fourth. Right. I, I don't think the MHSA is going to say is going to lift a finger. Yeah. They're just going to say, you know what? We said we're done. We're done. And on you've got a month you've got a, a month dead period or whatever and then they'll say June first do whatever you want for the summer but we're done with that's it. what they, and that's yeah. and that's essentially what they said that the release that they had because uh, Rich Kimball you know was that got the release last when we did the podcast last and they talked about from June first on but they didn't say anything about May and they were supposed to come out and say something about May my thing is this and this is what I told the coaches I said if you're gonna make an argument because when you read the MHA uh, MHSA release they said specifically about the state of emergency going into June. And, you know, at that time, Governor Whitmer had, had asked for an extension to the state of emergency for 70 days into June, and she didn't get it. So that state of emergency is actually going to end at this, the end of this month. So, you know, the, you know, I can go back and pull the quotes, and they've asked me to do it. I don't know if I'm going to do it from Mark Yule. That just, you know, he talked about, well, you know, if something changes with the state of emergency, then you know, we, we, we might be able to do something, you know, implying that, but I don't expect anything. To happen. I, would, I would think that if, if everything is lifted and you can play from May 5th through June 1st, I would, I would guess that it, it would be schools contacting other schools or coaches contacting other coaches saying, Open it up. let's get some officials, we'll, let, we'll play somewhere, let's just play some exhibition games to play. Because you know what's going to happen. I mean, you know, Ohio did not cancel school. Governor DeWayne down there has, has held steadfast, and, and he's taken the approach of let's just reevaluate every week. Yeah. And, you know, they, they, are, they are very optimistic uh, in speaking with some of the top coaches in Ohio about them having a season. They've already got it built out. There's a plan that starts on May 4th. And we'll they, save it for second thought. We'll save it for second thoughts. But they're, they're, Ohio's curve is way different than Michigan's. Well, that's fine. And stress, but, stress on our infrastructure is a little bit different, but we'll save that for a, where we can start yelling at each other. 
<laughs> well, I will say this, as, as it always comes back to lacrosse, and, and for, for me, I, it always comes back to the 80s, um, there, there's a physician that I follow that on, on Facebook named Adam Brochert. I don't know if that name rings a bell for anybody, uh, but Brochert was the, the, the third captain along with David Morrow and David Rivers of that 1989 undefeated Midwest and state championship Brother Rice team. Um, Brochert had the, separated his shoulder popped it back and came back and scored the game-winning goal in overtime for, for Rice to go undefeated in 89. Um, he's now a, a radiologist and a physician out in Las Vegas, and he's been breaking down the CDC stats and numbers. Like, he's not looking at what Fox says or CNN or press conferences. He is in the data, uh, and he's very positive about He thinks that a lot of these areas – should start opening up and that they should start changing the policy from blankets to yes you have a high percentage of diabetes elderly this that i and i don't i'm not an expert i'm i'm just really positive the the fact that somebody as smart as him if you go and look up his name on amazon he's written all the books for all the mcat study guides and stuff like that too he's really a smart cookie um and he's been very positive on this so i'm staying optimistic that we might have some sort of lacrosse this year uh, if if this does start to turn, but uh, it's I, gonna, I don't... It's, I'll tell you what, it's going to be miserable when we watch Ohio raise two state championships, and our poor seniors here, you know, may not even have a game as a team, except you know, a tournament or something. Maybe I'm, that's that's my fear. Everything that I'm doing is for those kids. If anything I can do to bring coaches together to put some sort of an argument together, I mean, I, it, it's an uphill battle. I know, and you know, we we don't say this lightly with the uh, situation and the, and the loss of life. Um, you know, it's lacrosse, it is what it is, and, and you know, I'm just gonna do what I can for the seniors, that's it. Yeah. And it. And it's frustrating because w right now on April 14th, we just don't know. You right. know. I don't think we can accurately predict what's gonna happen in the next week, two weeks, three weeks, and yeah. we won't be able to do anything until the governor, uh, president, every, everybody says it's all clear. Right. clear to, to play and even then i don't know if there's going to be some sort of an official uh right season or games it's probably going to be somewhat unofficial and if rice wants to go down and play the ohio champion oh, okay i you know if they agree sure let's let's do it yeah well they, they just announced a tournament in indianapolis at the end of july yeah. called I just it Classic. yeah so, but that's so, I mean, that's just late. I mean, it, it could work if everything's pushed back, right. but that late in July, Coach Colin and I were talking about that earlier. Chris, you're saying how late it, late it is. Most of the summer tournaments uh, that were in the early part of June are now getting bugged back to the last week in July, first week in August. Yeah. So you're starting to see all those um, late May, early June tournaments that are pretty uh, well attended by college coaches and by a lot of you know, kids too. Especially this year, uh, they're 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 bumping those things back. I think mid mid uh, mid July is when it's actually going to start, and it's going to get. You know, I actually was looking at my schedule. I have a uh, two weeks where I'm gone for seven days straight, going to multiple things because everything's backing into each other now. So. Yeah. I'm going to talk to uh, Governor Whitner. I, I tried to get on her calendar for tomorrow at noon in Lansing. So when I'm up there, I'm going to try and uh, swing by and see her. Well, Let's tell her I said hello. Um, yeah. Give her my uh, best. Let's see. <laughs> uh, yesterday, uh, Chris Marucci and some other coaches and officials had uh, a conference call to talk about the state of the women's game, what they want to do as far as uh, play dates and games and s things like that. So they're, they're putting in place a plan where they might be able to play uh, games during the week before a weekend tournament or have early weekend tournaments, especially if some of the uh, months are clear, like June, where a lot of the events are being pushed back or canceled completely. Yep. So they're going to put together a list of coaches that have shown some interest. They're going to, in turn, talk to their, uh, their players to see if there's an interest to put together teams to at least have some sort of a, uh, a girl season from, let's say, open date till – the first tournament so to at least give the the seniors an opportunity to play for at least a month uh three weeks something so they can play multiple games during the days officials were on the call they're ready to cover it 
Uh, they're just looking for, I guess, uh, teams that are willing to play, a few dates that work out with everybody, and then some uh, locations. But they're they're starting to get things in place to have some sort of a yeah. season. Soon. They have to. Yeah. I mean, you'd be doing a disservice right now to the seniors if you didn't. I mean, that, that's my whole goal right now. So I'm just trying to see what's out there and, and just test the pulse of uh, really Illinois that's still open and also Ohio that's still open. Indiana shut down. Um, and, and really the coaches here in Michigan. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was texting a lot of them tonight. So, Mike, as we kind of wrap this up, parting shots, um, thanks for all your feedback on, on the events and, and what we can probably step up and do. Um, I will lean on you for names and recommendations or, or you know, vouching on if I, if I do get names. Um, I, we've, I think we've done a really good job on this of representing – kind of half and half men's and women's, uh, yeah. half college, half high school. We've got some old legends. we got some young up-and-comers, um, some Hall of Famers, so, some, you know, like like, like um, the Ovid Elsie guy who was just like, hey, I started a program. Um, who else should we have? Who, who's on your short list, whether it's youth, travel, high school, college, men's, women's, coaches, officials? Um, I think Rob Ambrose would be a great one. I'd love to hear his stories about when he played because he's, we're kind of about the same age. And I remember him, you know, hearing that name when I was in high school, whether it was about baseball or something and, you know, hearing about Brother Rice back then. So Ambrose would be good. Uh, actually, Chris Marucci would be really good as far as, you know, he's coached at uh, state championship with Cranbrook and some uh, uh, teams uh, collegiately and his club I think how he started up the club that has become a, a, a power would be an interesting story um, let's see those are the two that that kind of just stick out to me um, young coaches I don't know uh, Garland country day that'd be a good one yeah he's um, he's He's definitely been very out there in front of, of the media and in, in the conversations. He was on Lax Records podcast, yeah. um, you know, and, and I, I know him from doing his games, but I don't know him as well as I know some of the other guys. Um, so I'll, I'll ping him as an idea as well. I, I know if Hebert's uh, available, you know, I, I love Ron. He's he's my old seventh and eighth grade teacher at St. Hugo. And, um, you know, even Mike Cahill and I were joking the other day, what, what if – what if Hebert never leaves Rice to go to Cranbrook in 1991-92 in <laughs> offseason? Yeah. Um, you know, what happens and what goes on with that program? So I'd, I'd be curious to have some of his, you know, we could even just do an episode of people telling stories about Ron. Um, yeah. I'm sure we all have a good one or two. One last story uh, on that. Back in, I think it was 02, 03, when I got started, there was uh, Ron had a coaching clinic in the wintertime out at Troy. He held that, and I, and I got wind of that, and I said, oh, this, this should be pretty good. Uh, so it was Sundays, unfortunately. So I remember pretty much for the eight weeks or whatever in leaving church early, early to get out, drive from Plymouth to Troy for this <laughs> coach's clinic. And I went two years just to – hear him talk about stories and talk about Jamie Monroe and all these other interesting That's things. cool. Yeah. That's very I, cool. I took that coaching clinic when he did it over at Ultimate Soccer Arenas, and, and I still use some of the techniques and explaining to a third and fourth grader or a dad about this sport does it this way, and now you do this sport and you do it this way. Just try yeah. it this way in lacrosse. Um, yeah, he's, he's definitely – you know, been there, done that. So um, mm -hmm. we, we try to go an hour. But we're way over, but – it's just okay. so nice catching up with you. Happy birthday yeah. again. Thanks. Um, we will, I, think uh, you beat, I, I think you beat Rich Campbell, so I think you now hold the record for the longest. <laughs> and we could it's go for another couple hours. We could. I mean, we, there was stuff yeah. that we haven't really talked about yet. Right. Well, we haven't hit anything yet. We really did. <laughs> we we got to go part two. We got to go part two with Mike. Right. I'm down. We, we might need to do just a 15-minute one of you going around the basement showing your <laughs> museum because you've got some really cool pieces in there. This um, right here is probably the number one thing. Syracuse 22, yep. signed by all three Powells. It's pretty cool. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That was a, that was a gift from got to say her name, Stephanie Saya, who was the Booster Club president at uh, the Plymouth Canton Salem. 
uh, Unified team, and that was a, a year-end coach's gift. It was like that's cool, oh, man. Unbelievable. Yeah. So, if you are somewhere where you know Gary Gate will be, would you take it out of the rafters to have Gate sign it too? No. You know why? It's a Powell jersey. Why? It's a Powell jersey, and I've got a Gate poster that he said to Mike, "Play hard, Gary Gate." What nice. more could you ask for? <laughs> all right, everybody, go follow Mike on Twitter, all lacrosse Michigan. It's A L L L A C R O S E. Right. Uh, on Facebook, his website, he's on Instagram, Twitter. Yeah, Facebook, it's everything. The center of the universe. <laughs> to, if you've listened this long and you're not following that, quit the game. You're, you're quit pretty game. screwed up. That's right. Yeah, you're pretty game. screwed up. I need 7,000. Twitter followers in a week. Go. Yeah, no joke. You should. <laughs> Good yeah. luck. There we go. I'm going to open up 7,000 accounts and join. You're going you're gonna to have <laughs> random John Losey. John Losey. John Losey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, I really enjoyed it. Everyone, happy birthday, Mike. Great night. Happy birthday, Mike. Thanks, guys.